As Raja mentioned, my name is Priya Narsiman. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Yinscam. It's based out of Pittsburgh, hence the Yins and Yinscam. Um, and I'm also a professor of electrical and computer engineering at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. So what I'm going to speak to you about today is changing the game for sports fans. A little bit on my background. Um, I was born in India. I was uh, raised in Africa. I actually finished my high schooling in um, Zambia in Africa. I was not a sports fan until I moved to Pittsburgh in 2001. Um, I moved to Pittsburgh to become a professor at Carnegie Mellon University uh, in the electrical and computer engineering department. And I was smitten after I went to my first Penguins hockey game. Until then, I was not really in love with any sport. And for those of you who know what faculty salaries are, that's the kind of seat we can afford. Um, so this is what I would do. I would go to every game, every chance that I would get. Um, and these are the kinds of seats that I would enjoy. And as you can imagine, you've met me. Um, everybody there is taller than I am. I would never see the goal, the fight, the save, anything when it counted for myself. And in fact, my experience at home was phenomenal. I mean, I can pause, I can DVR, I can control my whole experience, but I love the insanity of a live game. I love the insanity of being there with 17, 18,000 other people who are in the game, in with every shift, in with every play, and I just think that's spectacular. So I wanted a way that I could bring that control that I had on the couch, except I wanted it in the stadium. So that's really where we started this journey because obviously we couldn't fix my height. Ah. So um, what did we do? Well, first of all, we had to look at the landscape of what was possible to do inside the venue, to bring that kind of control that you had on the couch to the venue. Here are some of the things we ran into. So the first challenge is broadcast rights, right? So you quickly learn, you get an education in the sports industry, you quickly learn as a professor that you run into different kinds of challenges. Some are business challenges and some are technology challenges. I'll cover a bit of both. On the business side of things, what happens is all the rights for live video have already been sold outside the venue. There's a whole number of companies and organizations that carry games right to your home on your TV. So you obviously can't compete with them, right? So you're looking for a unique way to differentiate yourself inside the venue and to give you that unique experience inside the venue. So that's really where you end up starting, right? So, just for the heck of it, I wanted to show you one of the earliest prototypes. You can see how beautiful it looks right up there. Uh, and this is what we started with. This is the lab prototype version where way back when, as we found out that the Penguins were about to build a new arena, we started thinking, how can we stream different camera angles? How can you get that control you have at home? You can pause, you can look at different angles, you can look at all these things, except in the palm of your hands. So we started with that. We did the usual thing you do at Carnegie Mellon. You, you, know, you pick up a research project, you have a number of students who love this as much as you do, and you go off and start a research project and see how far you can take it. So that's the first lab prototype that we built. Right? The next challenge we ran into was a more technological one. So availability of Wi-Fi on phones. So remember we started back in 2005, 2006, 2007. If you look at that time, you didn't have Wi-Fi on a whole lot of phones. Nowadays, it's hard to buy a phone that does not have Wi-Fi on it. And remember, because of broadcast rights, we had to keep the experience to within the building, which meant we needed a technology that could actually geofence it to within the building. So it had to be Wi-Fi. So if you look at the availability of Wi-Fi on phones, that penetration was pretty abysmal when we started. Less than 10% of phones had Wi-Fi on them when we first got started. So by all rights, we shouldn't have taken this commercial because you know, Wi-Fi simply did not exist the way it is today. Right? We, we honestly lucked out in several ways because of technology trends. Like I said, there isn't a phone that doesn't have Wi-Fi today, which is great for us because that means we have 100% user base out there every time you go to a venue. Right? So the other um, piece of good fortune we had was the Pittsburgh Penguins. Right? Um, they had a new arena they were building at that point in time, Katsal Energy Center. Um, and they were looking for great technologies from the local community that could impact the arena, right? So um, they gave us a chance to go to Pilot, and you'll see some of these things on their website, where they partnered up with Carnegie Mellon and us to try a mobile video program. In fact, they were unique in being one of the first sports organizations to put Wi-Fi inside the bowl of their stadium. This is way back when. We're talking 2008, 2009. You hear of Wi-Fi inside stadiums very frequently today, but they started this way back when. So you can see that tweet up there where the Penguins were talking about having Wi-Fi so you as a fan could enjoy replays from different camera angles. 
Right? So that's really where we got started. So what is this experience that I'm talking about? So if you look at this picture up here, this is what we piloted with the penguins. So what we did was we took all these different camera angles, right? So you look at the different camera angles. Every red arrow rep there represents a camera angle. So you see the two under the video board. Um, they follow star players. They're called isocams. So they follow Crosby and Malkin. So think about this as a Crosby cam and a Malkin cam, right? You have the two goalie cams at the two ends, which are really nice. Um, and then let's take a look at a couple of other cameras, right? So you have the two on the bench, which, by the way, when your team is winning, is an absolutely awesome camera angle to watch the game from. Right? So you have the two bench cameras as well. So we would take all these camera angles and we would relay them to fan smartphones over Wi-Fi so you could pick the replay from whatever camera angle you chose. That was really the premise of this and it hadn't been done before. Right? So we really started with this with that premise in mind. Some more pictures. This is how we were testing at the Civic Arena. Here's another thing about Wi-Fi. Um, you all know that it it doesn't take very many people to load a Wi-Fi access point, right? So if you start streaming video, this is video we're talking about, right? If you start streaming video on top of Wi-Fi, you'll get congestion very, very quickly. Today, you have things called high-density Wi-Fi, HD Wi-Fi. In those days, it didn't exist, right? So if you think about a Wi-Fi network and putting video on top of it, you can get congested very quickly. So here's all the testing that we did with a number of students. You, can, you could see us walking around the Civic Arena at the time with clipboards full of different phones, trying to load up the network, trying different camera angles, and really, really testing this as much as we possibly could. And also what's interesting about the Civic Arena for anyone who's been in there is it is a concrete and steel jungle. And for anyone who knows anything about Wi-Fi, concrete and steel and Wi-Fi are not friends. Right? And so we had a huge challenge in actually trying to get a better experience. A little anecdote here. We would actually be able to cover the other side of the bowl from an access point on this side because uh, the Civic Arena was dome-shaped. So the Wi-Fi would go up, reflect off of the ceiling, and come down to the seats on the other side. It's that interesting, the behavior of these kinds of signals inside a building. So this is the kind of testing we did. We built that up to the app that was actually released. The Pittsburgh Penguins were the first to release an app with these different camera angles in it, where you could tap on one of these, uh, see the replay, and see from any camera angle you chose. Now, the first game we went live as a pilot, we had seven users. I was over the moon. I thought seven people in this world are using something I built. We must be onto something really great here. Um, end of the season, my, one of my favorite pictures, we had enough of an audience, enough of an audience watching every game with hours of replays being watched. Because remember, we had a replay for every play of the, every game from every camera angle, right? So we had hours of replays being watched, and I thought, I have a company on my hands. And that's really when we spun this off, right? So this picture was actually taken around the time that we spun this off. And I did a word cloud um, with you know, feedback from fans who were using it in the Civic Arena. And you can see by the words up there, you know, it's awesome, replays. You see all the different camera angles they were enjoying. And we knew we had a company on our hands. Right? So that's literally when we spun it off. OK, so we've done one. OK, so we took something from the lab into the real world. That's just the first box you check off. Right? And we've proven it can work. And we've proven there are users. Right? And so that's all we had done at that point in time. This was 2009. How do we take this and scale this to hundreds of teams? We support about 140 teams now. We support teams in Canada, in Australia. Uh, we support them around the world. Uh, but how did we take it from that lab to the field to now all the way um, across the world, right? So when we first started, again, one of my favorite pictures, this is what our infrastructure looked like. <laughs> it was a closet in a back room, an equipment closet a bunch of laptops, a bunch of old servers, lots of cables, all strung up together. We managed everything, right? Which is great, by the way. It's very liberating to be in control of your entire infrastructure. But here's the big problem. If you think about any sporting event, okay, and I'll show you the example for hockey, right? This is what usage looks like for a hockey game, right? So imagine you have a hockey game at 7 p.m. tonight. Throughout the whole week, the usage is next to nothing. And then for four hours of the game, it skyrockets, right? So what were we doing? We were paying for servers and storage for all of those other days, even though we needed only for four hours on game day. Right? So if you think about the costs we were incurring, they were huge. Now, you take this one step further and think about NFL, 
right? So NFL, if you look at it, you have typically most games on Sunday. So all week long, you have next to nothing usage. And then on Sunday, all of Sunday afternoon, it skyrockets, right? So our usage model wasn't built to accommodate us just buying boatloads of equipment. We couldn't scale that way. So we had to look for a different solution, which is when we went with cloud computing. So what is cloud computing? It's the ability to rent rather than buy. For those of you who want to rent apartments that rather than buy a home, there are huge advantages to renting a home rather than buying one, right? And it's the same thing with cloud computing. You pay as you go, just like you pay for electricity. You pay for hours or minutes of usage rather than buying servers. And what's great is uh, cloud computing platforms such as Amazon, they're there worldwide. I mean, you look at that, it's 11 geographic regions around the world. And here's a map showing you where all the places they're in. Right? So if you look at it, if I, as a teeny tiny company out of Pittsburgh, want to scale my business across the world and now operate all the way in Sydney, which is where we are, the best way is to go with a provider who lets you lease storage servers on the go per minute, per hour, whenever you want it, and then drop it on the floor when you don't. And it was an ideal model for us. It literally helped us scale and take our business overseas. Right? And here's another good example, cloudy with a chance of football, right? So if you look at our NFL Sunday usage, typically it's about 100x, 100 times of what you see on a normal non-game day. And we are able to, on an NFL Sunday, spin up servers as fast as we need to and drop them at the end of Sunday as fast as we need to. And all it takes is a bunch of buttons that we push on a website. Right? And that has helped us, it's called elastic computing, that has helped us really scale our business and take it somewhere else. Okay, another point, one of my favorite ones is minimizing manual intervention. Right? So we're talking about how do you take something from the lab, you take it into the arena, it works, and now you take it overseas, it still works. But what about manual intervention? Right? So when I first started the company, I would send a staff member to every game, and their job was to do start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, every time we saw a replay. You can imagine how much they love their jobs. Right? And not to mention in very fast-moving sports, such as basketball and hockey, you could very quickly miss replays. Because the game is going by so fast, you can't keep up with your starting and stopping. Right? So what we needed was a way to avoid manual intervention so we could really scale and scale globally and scale for any sport. We were fortunate enough to start the year off by supporting the Super Bowl. We actually built the Super Bowl stadium app um, this year. And so you can see a look at uh, you know, what we did for the Super Bowl, a close-up angle, even all the way up in the nosebleed stands. Right? So that, that literally expresses what we're trying to do. But let's talk about the manual intervention side. Okay, so here's the Super Bowl app that you see, and here are all the plays. We had 432 plays of the Super Bowl from four different camera angles. You tap on one of those plays, and you get the four different camera angles. You tap on a camera angle, you get the video of that replay from that camera angle. My favorite one happens to be the overhead cable cam that drops behind the huddle. You can actually see the play develop. Right, so you can see this for 432 plays. Every one of these plays, was automatically generated by us. No human in the loop. And what we do for that is, you look at each of those stats there. So for example, it's a shotgun, T Brady, pass short left to B LaFell for 11 yards, touchdown. We look at that, we look at the game clock, the play clock, the stats feed. We look at the combination of all those, put them together and estimate the length of a play. Right? Once we estimate the length of the play, we go back into the video feeds and slice the length of the play and spit it out and it takes seconds. And we do that without a human in the loop. This means we can just run this anywhere without a human in the loop. The proof of this is that none of my staff go out to games anymore, unless they want to go watch the game and they happen to be a fan. They don't go out to games anymore because the thing can run itself. This helped us, again, to really, really, really scale the way we needed to. Challenge number five, continuing to push the envelope. So it isn't enough just to sit on what you've done. Right? So at this stage, we support about 140 different professional teams and leagues, 25 out of 32 NFL clubs, 22 NBA clubs, the entire National Rugby League in Australia, um, the Australian Rules Football League, the National Basketball League in Australia. We support teams in the Canadian Football, uh, Canadian Football League. We support uh, NCAA schools. So we have a whole range of options. We also have some designations with some of these leagues. For example, with the NBA and the NFL, we have some official designations with them. So we've really grown this from, this was a lab project, 
all the way to where people are now adopting this across the world. But you can't just sit on that, right? So continuing to push the envelope means, what else can we run video on? Right, so this is at Texas A&M at Kyle Field, their new stadium that was just renovated. We're now carrying video on every display they have there. They have 1,400 displays of different sizes around the stadium that are all showing video. It's not on mobile anymore alone. It's also on all these displays. And here's the beautiful part about it. You can use your mobile phone to control these displays. We let you scan your ticket. And once you scan your ticket, we know which areas of the stadium are go you're going to be in. And from there, using your own mobile phone, you can control the volume, control the channels, control the TV experience, control everything around you. So we've now taken this from it's not just in your hands, but it changes the world around you, right? And again, that's a unique part of this. Another one, which happens to be one of my other favorites, you've all heard about wearables, right? With virtual reality, you've heard of different kinds of devices that are available. Um, you know, it started with Google Glass, and now you have Google Cardboard, Oculus, you have all these different things. This was with Google uh, Glass, right? This was a couple of seasons ago. Here's a fan at a basketball game, right? This happens to be for the Golden State Warriors, and he has a glass device. Now, what's interesting about this is, let's look at the experience he's seeing. Through that glass device, he's actually seeing right through to the court in front of him. And here's the best part. The experience comes to him instead of him picking up his phone and trying to find it. So what happens is every single time there's a push notification, someone has scored, it's overlaid on his glass device. He can tap it on the side and suddenly he sees the replay as the basket side. Tap it once more, sees the replay from another angle. He never has to take his device out all game long. And now we've taken the same infrastructure, but we've supported on a different kind of product and created yet another disruptive experience, right? And that's really unique in the kinds of things that we tend to do. Just a sense of the numbers and then um, I'll wind up. Um, the numbers, the scale of the systems we support, we had over the course of the last year and to date about 30 million installs of what we've done. Um, you can see 5 billion page views, 5 billion impressions of the products that we've had, which means we've again taken it from this journey of starting off with something that was a lab project held together by Band-Aid glue duct tape all the way onto the international stage and really proven our point. And then I'll leave you with my favorite picture of all time. That's because my two-year-old is in it. Um, so this is the group of students who helped to do the pilot way back when um, at the Civic Arena, the group of Carnegie Mellon students who took that journey with me when we did the pilot, and the Penguins won the Stanley Cup that year. So we were fortunate enough to have that. My two-year-old worked every single game with me, and I'd carry him back after triple overtime for the Penguins sleeping. Um, and I'm attached to this picture because it shows us where we started and how we crossed the finish line with the Penguins as well. And with that, I thank you for your time and thank you for listening.